स्वयं प्रभा डिजिटल इंडिया एजुकेटेड इंडिया in the last lecture we defined the integral of a continuous function defined on the image of a curve gamma we defined the integral to be the limit of the riemann sums uh, over all partitions as the partition size goes to zero and we did prove that the limit does exist and we called that the limit of f over gamma denoted it as integral of f of z dz over gamma we also discuss some of the properties of this uh, integral so in this lecture we will study the complex analog of the fundamental theorem of calculus rather the first fundamental theorem of calculus let me write down the uh, setting and uh, begin the lecture so we will be discussing the first fundamental theorem of calculus in a course on real analysis you would have seen a version of the first fundamental theorem of calculus what did the first fundamental theorem of calculus in real analysis tell us it told us that if there is a function small f such that capital f is an anti derivative or rather capital f prime of z is equal to small f of z then the integral of f of z over from a to b where it is all these are defined over ab is equal to capital f of b minus capital f of z the complex analog is quite similar let me write down the statement and then we will discuss about that so theorem let omega be an open subset of c and f from omega to c be a continuous function and now you will have to talk about the existence of an anti derivative let capital f from omega to c be an anti derivative what does it mean to say that capital f is an anti derivative of small f i e our function capital f is holomorphic on omega to begin with not only is it holomorphic but its complex derivative at each point is equal to small f of z i e capital f is holomorphic on omega and capital f prime of z is equal to small f of z for all z in omega so this is the uh, meaning of capital f being an anti derivative of small f so what is the uh, fundamental theorem of calculus going to tell us suppose gamma is a rectifiable curve uh, defined in omega that means that gamma from ab to c is a curve such that gamma of ab is sitting inside omega is contained in omega suppose gamma is a rectifiable curve defined on omega then the integral of f of z dz over gamma this is equal to f of z1 minus f of z0 where z0 is the initial point of gamma or rather gamma of a and z1 is the terminal point of gamma or in other words gamma of b so the complex analog is as one would uh, expect it's capturing some a statement very similar to the one in real analysis let's give a proof let's begin the proof by observing that uh, we have only imposed the condi condition here that our curve gamma is rectifiable so if you uh, recall from the previous lecture Uh, if we put more regularity assumptions on our curve gamma we will be able to get a better or an easily workable form of integral of f of z dz in particular 
let me write that part down suppose our curve gamma is having more regularity suppose gamma is continuously differentiable then then what do we have then let's recall the change of variable formula that we had proved in the last lecture then integral of f of z dz over gamma this is going to be equal to integral from a to b the usual Riemann integral applied to the real part and the imaginary part of f of gamma of t gamma prime t dt we can write our uh, integral in this manner if the function capital F is uh, if the uh, curve gamma is a continuously differentiable curve and now let us apply the fact that capital F is an antiderivative since f prime of z is equal to f of z for all z in omega integral of f of z dz over gamma this is going to be equal to integral a to b capital F of gamma of capital F prime of gamma of t gamma prime of t dt. Now by invoking the chain rule, uh, I will just put it as an exercise for you to sit down and check that by the chain rule along with the Cauchy Riemann equations applied to capital F by the chain rule and the CR equations. This chain rule I am talking about is the chain rule in higher dimensions which uh, I will assume from a course on real analysis in several variables. This is going to be equal by chain rule f prime of gamma of t. Remember that f prime is the complex derivative of f capital F gamma prime t is equal to f composed with gamma prime t dt and therefore integral of f of z dz over gamma this is going to be equal to integral of f composed with gamma prime t dt and this can be now deciphered by using the uh, fundamental first fundamental theorem of calculus proved in the real analytics set, real analysis setting which will tell us that this is equal to f of gamma of d minus f of gamma of a which is equal to f of z1 minus f of z0 so if the curve gamma is continuously differentiable our work becomes extremely easy and we will be able to conclude the fundamental theorem of calculus the complex analog rather from the fundamental theorem of calculus proved in the real analytic setting in the real analysis setting however uh, we have put uh, more generality here we are only assuming that our curve is rectifiable and therefore we will not have uh, this expression in general so we will have to work a bit more to prove our uh, result in the complex analog case so we will prove the result for uh, rectifiable curves by using the connectedness of the uh, compact set ab where the curve gamma is defined so let's start by defining the set omega epsilon so given epsilon positive or maybe u epsilon given epsilon positive let u epsilon be the collection of all those t in a b uh, such that when you restrict the curve gamma from a to t then the fundamental theorem of calculus is satisfied up to an error term given by epsilon so let me just write down what that means uh, let u epsilon be the set of all t such that the integral from a to t of f of z dz minus f of gamma of t minus f of gamma of a this absolute value is less than epsilon times the uh, arc length of gamma restricted to a t. So let's look at the set epsilon or, or maybe I should be a little more careful this is satisfied for all a less than or equal to t0 less than or equal to t. So here as well I should be a little more careful this is less than or equal to epsilon times the arc length of gamma restricted to 
a comma t naught for all a less than or equal to t naught less than or equal to t. We will prove that the set u epsilon is both open and closed at the same time. And since small a belongs to u epsilon, it is non-empty as well. And by invoking the connectedness of the closed interval a b, we will be able to conclude that u epsilon is equal to uh, the entire closed set a b. And our choice of epsilon is uh, uh, arbitrary and because of that we will be able to get that integral from a to b of f of z dz and f of gamma of b minus f of gamma of a are arbitrarily close and then we would be done. So, enough to show now enough to show that u epsilon is both open and closed. Let us prove that it is closed, closedness. So, let t uh, 0 be a limit point of omega epsilon. That means, there exists t n converging to t uh, t naught, where t n a are elements in omega epsilon. So, the first observation is that if t n is greater than t naught, then we are done, then t naught is, is automatically in omega epsilon because if t is in omega epsilon, all t prime less than or equal to t will also be in epsilon. That is how the definition of epsilon, omega epsilon is. And because of that, we can, we have, we can assume that uh, t n is a sequence converging to t naught from below. Hence, we may assume t n converges up to t naught. Okay, so if you now notice what is uh, f of z dz over gamma restricted to uh, a comma t naught minus f of uh, gamma of t naught minus f of gamma of a. Let us look at this. This absolute value this is equal to the integral of f of z dz of gamma restricted to a t n plus gamma restricted to t n comma t naught. So, this is the concatenation of the curves gamma restricted to a t n and the curve gamma restricted to t n comma t naught. Now, here we will introduce uh, a couple of terms t naught minus f of gamma of t n plus f of gamma of t n minus f of gamma of a. And uh, by the properties of the complex integral we have already discussed, this is just going to be equal to the absolute value of integral of f of z dz of gamma over gamma restricted to a comma t n minus f of gamma of t n minus f of gamma of a. Maybe I should change this equality by triangle inequality this will be less than or equal to the first term being this plus the absolute value of integral gamma restricted to t n comma t naught of f of z dz minus f of gamma of t naught minus f of uh, gamma of t n. Now, since t n belongs to the set omega epsilon, remember what uh, omega uh, u epsilon was. Okay, so I used an omega epsilon here, maybe I should change it here to omega epsilon. So that it will be consistent. Yeah. So if uh, t n belongs to uh, omega epsilon, then by the very definition, this condition is satisfied by t n. That means that the first term 
is bounded by epsilon times the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t n. And how about the second term? Now, the second term we can say that is less than or equal to some capital M f is a continuous function uh, on the closed end on the image of gamma of a b which is a compact set and therefore it is always bounded above by some capital M and by again using one of the, the integral from uh, gamma restricted to T n comma T naught minus capital F or yeah, this is less than or equal to this plus absolute value of capital F of gamma of T naught minus gamma of T n. Now, the function capital F is holomorphic on omega in particular it is continuous, it is continuous at every point of omega and in particular it is continuous at T naught. So, by picking uh, T and uh, T n arbitrarily close to T naught and by using the uniform continuity of uh, gamma, we can ensure that this term can be made less than any delta that we would like to have. So, let me just write it down. Uh, given uh, an epsilon prime positive, we can pick, I leave the details to you, T n arbitrarily close to T naught such that this is less than or equal to epsilon times the arc length of gamma restricted to T n plus m times epsilon prime or rather m plus 1 times epsilon prime, some constant times epsilon prime. So, we given any epsilon prime, we will be able to make it uh, as small as we want. But then what were we estimating? We were estimating the term this, this was the term we were estimating. So, let me just uh, write that down again so that we, we know exactly what we were doing. Hence, what do we have? The absolute value of integral of f of z from a to t naught, this minus f of gamma of t naught minus f of gamma of a, this is less than or equal to epsilon times the, the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t n plus m plus 1 times epsilon prime and this is true for every epsilon prime that we can. So, this tells us that the quantity here is in particular less than or equal to epsilon times the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t which hence is less than or equal to epsilon times the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t naught and that is precisely what we had set out to prove and therefore t naught belongs to omega epsilon and hence omega epsilon is closed. Uh, omega epsilon is the name we have given. I just changed the name from u epsilon to omega epsilon. So, let me stick to the omega epsilon. Right now, omega epsilon is a subset of the interval a b and it should not be confused as being a subset of omega even though I use the notation omega epsilon. All right. Let us now prove that omega epsilon is an open subset as well. So, the next claim is to prove that omega epsilon is open. So, notice that we have still not used the fact that capital F is a holomorphic function. We will, we will prove that if T naught is now a point in omega epsilon, we will prove that T naught is an interior point. And in order to do that, we will use the fact that capital F is complex differentiable at the point gamma of T naught. Let us prove that T naught, any point T naught in omega epsilon is going to be an interior point. So, let T naught be and that would prove that omega epsilon is uh, uh, open. Now, if T prime is less than T naught, then T prime is already in an element of omega epsilon and because of that uh, for any delta such that T naught minus delta to T naught uh, plus delta is contained in capital AB, T naught minus delta to T naught is already in omega epsilon. So, let me just note that uh, for 
delta positive such that t naught minus delta two t naught plus delta is contained in omega in contained in a b we have t naught minus delta to t naught this set is contained in uh, omega epsilon by the very definition of omega epsilon so we'll just prove that for t in uh, t naught to t naught plus delta where our delta is yet to be picked we will prove that all the points here belong to omega epsilon that is the goal and in order to do that let us use the fact that uh, capital F is holomorphic at the point gamma of t naught since uh, F is holomorphic at gamma of t naught given epsilon positive Maybe we will change this epsilon later according to our requirement. Let us see. Given epsilon positive, there exists a delta such that such that the Newtonian sums capital F of gamma of t minus the uh, capital F of gamma of t naught by gamma of t minus gamma of t naught. This is arbitrarily close to epsilon close to the derivative of capital F which is small f which we know is small f, this is less than epsilon, maybe let us put a by 2, if, if needed we will correct it later. Whenever t belongs to t naught comma, okay, let me not include t naught, t naught comma t naught plus delta. So, this can be arranged by using the holomorphicity or complex differentiability of capital F at uh, t naught and rewriting this what do we have then absolute value of capital F of gamma of t minus capital F of gamma of t naught minus F of gamma of t naught into gamma of t minus gamma of t naught this is less than or equal to epsilon by 2 times the absolute value of gamma of t minus gamma of t naught. Now, let us focus on the term here f of gamma of t naught times gamma of t minus gamma of t naught. This is exactly equal to uh, the integral of f of gamma of t naught dz where the integral is restricted to t naught comma t naught t naught comma t remember that t is greater than this I, let me uh, remind you that t naught is a element in the open interval t naught to t naught plus delta let us now use the uniform continuity of uh, f composed with uh, gamma to pick delta sufficiently small let delta be small enough if it is not small enough make it smaller so that so that the absolute value of f of uh, gamma of t minus f of gamma of t naught this is less than say epsilon by 2 then what do we have then the uh, integral of f of z dz over gamma restricted to t naught comma t minus the absolute value of this uh, f of gamma of t naught times gamma of t minus gamma of t naught. If you look at the quantity the, this absolute value remember that this thing on the right is exactly what we have here. So, we are estimating that term here. And that can be estimated in the in the following manner. This is going to be less than or equal to the integral of the absolute value of f of z minus f of gamma of t, uh, rather t naught dz over gamma restricted to t naught comma t. And we know that this is less than or equal to 
epsilon by 2 times the arc length of gamma restricted to t naught comma t. Okay, so let's get back to what we were proving. This is going to be equal to by using the triangle inequality now here. We apply the triangle inequality here and uh, we have, so we now have an estimate on the integral of f dz restricted to gamma t naught comma t. We also, we know how close to f of gamma of t naught times gamma of t minus gamma of t naught is. We also have estimated f capital F of gamma of t uh, minus capital F of gamma of t naught. So, notice that this is in particular less than or equal to epsilon by 2 times the arc length of gamma restricted to t naught comma t. And the integral here both are estimated by uh, f of gamma of t naught times gamma of t minus gamma of t naught to this order. So, let me now write down by using triangle inequality ends by triangle inequality. We have by adding and subtracting the terms integral of f of z dz over gamma restricted to t naught comma t minus f of gamma of t minus f of gamma of t naught. This term is approximated by epsilon times gamma restricted to t naught comma t. Notice that the epsilon by 2 was picked precisely for that. There is this epsilon by 2 and there is this epsilon by 2. Both of them will contribute to the epsilon here. Alright, so we are now in good shape because, alright, so we are now in good shape because uh, we now only need to add the uh, corresponding equation for t naught. So, we know that since t naught belongs to omega epsilon, we have the integral of f of z dz of gamma a restricted to a comma t naught minus f of gamma of uh, t naught minus f of gamma of a. This is less than or equal to epsilon times the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t naught. And let us call this star, let us call this. So, notice that integral of f of z dz over gamma restricted to a comma t is equal to the integral of f of z dz over gamma restricted to a comma t naught plus gamma restricted to t naught comma t, the concatenation of these two curves. And also by introducing this term, we can finally conclude by using the triangle inequality hence gamma restricted to a comma t of f of z dz minus f of gamma of t minus f of gamma of a. This is less than or equal to epsilon times the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t naught plus epsilon times the arc length of gamma restricted to t naught comma We know that the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t is going to be equal to the sum of the arc length of gamma restricted to a comma t naught plus the arc length of gamma restricted to t naught comma t which is in particular equal to epsilon times gamma restricted to a comma t and this is precisely what we had set out to prove. This is true for all t in t naught to t naught plus delta. Which implies that t naught minus delta to t naught plus delta is contained in omega epsilon. And hence, omega epsilon is open. It means that it is both open and closed and contains a 
we have by connectedness of a b omega epsilon is equal to a comma b so let's recall what it means to say that omega epsilon is equal to uh, a comma b it means that integral of f of z dz over gamma minus f of gamma of b minus f of gamma of a this absolute value is less than or equal to epsilon times the arc length of gamma gamma restricted to a comma b is exactly equal to the arc length of gamma but our choice of epsilon was arbitrary this is true for all epsilon positive we have concluded this that tells us that because our choice of epsilon is arbitrary f of z dz is equal to f of z1 minus f of z0 where z1 is equal to gamma of b and z0 is equal to gamma of a and this is precisely what we had set out to prove so even in the case when our curve gamma is rectifiable we do have the fundamental theorem of calculus the first fundamental theorem of calculus the first fundamental theorem of calculus is quite powerful in the sense that it helps us in computing the integral of functions whose antiderivative is already known over rectifiable curves so let us look at some of the nice applications of the first fundamental theorem of calculus so we know that we know that so this is completed that e to the power d by dz of e to the power z is equal to e to the power z that means e to the power z is the anti derivative of e to the power z in the whole complex plane hence uh, integral of e to the power z dz over any curve gamma is just going to be equal to e to the power z2 minus e to the power z1 where gamma is a curve so these are examples is a curve from z1 to z2 so i am being a little casual by saying that it is a curve from z1 to z2 it means that it is a rectifiable curve with initial point z1 and the terminal point z2 let's now look at another example we know that d by dz of z square is equal to 2z or rather half z square by 2 is equal to z now applying the fundamental theorem of calculus over any curve gamma of z dz this is going to be equal to z1 square minus z2 square by 2 where as earlier z1 is initial point or maybe i should uh, be a little careful now i made it z1 and z2 rather than z0 and z1 but yeah it's quite straightforward no confusion will come on. so these were entire functions let's look at uh, some function which is not an entire function on c minus 0 uh, we have d by dz of 1 by z to be equal to okay so let me put a minus already here minus of 1 by z is equal to 1 by z square now let's look at the integral of 1 by z square dz over some curve gamma we know that its anti derivative is equal to uh, minus of 1 by z so this is going to be minus of 1 by z 2 minus 1 by z 1 this is precisely what we will be getting let us now consider some power series in its domain of definition. Let uh, summation a n z minus z 0 be a power series converging in d z 0 r. So, that means r is the radius of convergence of this power series. Let, so this is capital F let g of z be equal to summation to the power n summation a n by n, to n plus 1 into z minus z 0 to the power n plus 1 
and we have g prime is equal to g prime of z is equal to capital F of z. By applying the fundamental theorem of uh, calculus, we have integral of summation a n z minus z 0 to the power n dz over gamma, this is just going to be equal to the uh, antiderivative being a, so the, since it converges at these points, this will also on dz0 r by z. This is going to be equal to summation um, a n times z1 minus z0 to the power n by n plus 1 minus z2 minus or rather z2 minus z0 to the power n plus 1 minus z1 minus z0 to the power n plus 1 by n plus 1. So we have crucially used the fact that uh, this series converges on every point of dz0r to write it like this. Okay, so let me stop here.